I want to welcome the online congregation to the CUNA Church of the Nazarene. We are in our third week of our sermon series called Just Jesus to All About Worship. Let's worship God together. Now, this morning I want to just share with you that we are all worshipers, and so I want you to say out loud at home, I am a worshiper. Now, I want to point out to you right now that right in this moment, you are practicing worship. Now, when you went online and you found the sermon and you made a choice within your heart and within your will, you said, I'm going to worship God. Now, what I want to encourage you is to worship God who's worthy of worship. I mean, our God is a God of holiness, truth, beauty, and love. He is worthy of being worshiped. I want to encourage you to put all distraction away and to give God your all. Give God all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength as you worship Him. Engage in worship with God. Now, we are all worshipers, and so every choice I make is an act of worship. Every emotion I feel is an act of worship. Every thought I think is an act of worship. Every word I speak is an act of worship. And every action I do is an act of worship. Just think about it. Now, the Scripture is so clear. It says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And the supreme commandment in Scripture a commandment that calls us to be worshipers of our God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Love God with all. Now, a definition of love is important, and love is about preference. And the way I like to illustrate it is, is that I like to look to marriage relationships. This is me with my wife, Mindy. I know I married up. But I just want to share with you that, you know, when I asked her to marry me, I was telling her, I prefer you and no one else. And when she said yes, she said, I'm preferring you and no one else. And so we prefer one another. And as we relate with one another, our marriage is a marriage of love. It's a marriage of preference. You see, two came together and made one. And, and so now we both have hearts, we both have will, and we have to work together. We're equal, so we work together on whose will is going to be done. And we work together on our affections or on our emotions. And we, we work together on it and figure out, well, who, who, which way are we going to go in how we feel? And, and in regards to our mind, our reason, we reason differently, and we have to figure out how we're going to reason together. And you see, it, it's kind of this dynamic relationship that's kind of like a dance, but it's absolutely beautiful. And the Bible calls it mutual submission because we're equal partners, and we work it out together. And it's not about 50-50. It's 100%, 100% in respecting and loving one another so that the outcome is, is that there's a real and authentic relationship. Now, let me just show you again the four human engines, the heart, the soul, the mind, the strength. You see, love is to govern our hearts, our soul, our minds, and our strengths according to the supreme commandment. And the love is essential to being whole and healthy people. Now, here's a definition of love. Agape, God's love, divine love. Agape is love that prefers what God prefers. And so, what God loves, I love. What God wills, I will. What God feels, I feel. What God thinks, I think. What God does, I do. You see, when God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit governs you, 
Because God is supreme. Because, because God is greater than I. God is a greater relationship. Mindy and I, we prefer each other, and we're equal. We're mutual in our relationship. But when we're dealing with God, God is holiness. God is truth. God is beauty. God is love. He is worthy of worship and adoration. And therefore, I surrender to God. And so I love what he loves, and I will what he wills, and I feel what he feels, and I think what he thinks, and I do what he does. That's what it is to be a worshiper. And so I am a worshiper of God. Now this morning, I want to share with you some definitions of worship. But i got to make it very clear here is that I need you to engage with God in worship with your all. Because I'm taking you to the weight room, and you know, even though you're only ready for the first little weight on the stack, I'm putting it on the full stack in these definitions. And I just want you to be aware of that. But I want you to engage in your mind and your heart and your soul and your strength with these definitions that these Christians have written because they've taken the time to think about worship. Well, here's, an illust- here, here's a definition from William Temple. Worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It is the quickening of conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of mind with his truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, and the surrender of will to his purpose. And all of this gathered up in adoration, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable and therefore the chief remedy for that self-centeredness, which is our original sin and the source of all actual sin. I mean, we could take a whole hour just talking about that definition. Here's another definition that comes from John Frame. Redemption is the means. Worship is the goal. In one sense, worship is the whole point of everything. It is the purpose of history, the goal of the whole Christian story. Worship is not one segment of the Christian life among others. Worship is the entire Christian life seen as a priestly offering to God. And when we meet together as a church, our time of worship is not merely a preliminary to something else. Rather, it is the whole point of our existence as the body of Christ. Oh, church, I just want to encourage you when you can to gather with the body of believers in your local church. Here's another definition of worship coming from the Gospel Coalition Worship is the response of the whole being, heart, soul, mind, strength, to beholding God's glory. It is enabled by the Holy Spirit. There is no worship apart from spiritual regeneration. It is fixated on the gospel truth. We behold God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. It is directed by God's self-revealing word. We don't intuitively figure out what pleases God. It involves personal and corporate expressions. We worship in all of life as well as in church gatherings. Human beings are hardwired for worship. Thus, worship of someone or something is inevitable. But the worship that pleases God, worship that that proceeds from a heart that sees and loves him is only possible by, possible by the saving work of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now here's a definition of worship from John Wesley. In divine worship, as in all other actions, the first thing to be considered is the end, and the next thing is the means conducing to that end. The end of worship Divine worship is the honor of God and the edification of the church. And then God is honored when the church is edified. The means conducing to that end are to have the service so administered, the worship service so administered as may inform the mind and engage engage the affections, the heart and the soul and increase devotion of our God, who is a holy God of truth, beauty, and love. Now, here's your pastor's definition. It focuses more on the means. Worship is the practice of grace that participates with the Spirit to give supreme value to God from our whole being and transforms us into Christ-likeness. All of these definitions are definitions of worship, of those who've really thought about what it means to be 
a worshiper and what it means to worship God. And I want to encourage you to take some time and think about what would your definition of worship be informed by the Bible? What would your definition of worship be? Now, if you will, turn in your Bibles this morning, and the text we're going to look at, because we've been journeying in the Gospel of John, and the Holy Spirit has been teaching us about worship in this Gospel. And so turn with me to John chapter 14, verses 15 through 31. Beginning in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. You heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. The reading of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Spirit-inspired Holiness, truth, beauty, and love wrapped up and written about the blessed person of Jesus Christ. Now, this morning I want you to begin to think about a relationship that's really significant to you. Mindy and I have been married for 30 years. We have journeyed together. We, this, this relationship is, is one that um, I adore. I mean, uh, she really does complete me. And, you know, um, being able to journey with her, I've learned so much about life. Now, if she were to come to me, and if your significant relationship would come to you and say, I'm leaving, and where I'm going, you can't come, how would you feel? You know, I would probably be troubled I would be grieving. I would have hurt and pain and frustration. It, it's natural. And now I want you to think about Jesus and his relationship with his disciples. I mean, think about who Jesus is and who he is if you were to have a personal, dynamic, earthly relationship with him. I mean, talk about experiential church on steroids. I mean, talk about someone who just completes you, somebody who knows you, somebody who is a perfect responder. I mean, think about that. In Jesus Christ, you have the one who is holiness. You have the one who is truth. You have the one who is truly beauty and the one who is love. And I mean, he was humble and comforting, and meek, and merciful, and pure, and peaceful, and powerful, and protective, and kind, and good, and faithful, and gentle, and self-controlled, and patient, and selfless, and infinitely admirable, and infinitely valuable, and infinitely enjoyable, and infinitely satisfying. I mean, this is a friend of friends. 
I mean, to have a relationship with him is like an earthly dream. And so now, Jesus had been journeying with his disciples and with those that were following him, men and women, and the intimate disciples, the, the twelve. And now he comes to his disciples and he says to them, I'm leaving you, and where I'm going, you cannot come. They're hearts, their souls, their minds, their strength are in shock. The scripture says that they're troubled and Jesus confronts it and he says to them, do not let your hearts be troubled. I mean, he's saying this because their hearts are troubled. And, and then he says in our passage of scripture today, he says, peace I leave with you, wholeness I leave with you, my, my wholeness, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. But I think it's so important for our context to understand that they were troubled. They were afraid. When, when you look at their human hearts and you look at their being, the, the four human engines within them, and you have to remember, we have to understand this in context, that the disciples at this point in John's gospel are still governed by their sin. They need to be set free from the principle of sin. And I know in the way that we like to read stories, we like to read stories, uh, we, we want the disciples to be heroes. We want them to be whole. We want them to be set free. We want them, but, but you see, the gospel doesn't allow us to put them in that relational position with God. It tells us over and over in John's gospel that they're governed by their sin. And so they have hearts that are governed by sin and, 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 and a souls that are governed by sin and the minds that are governed by sin and strength that's governed by sin. And in this context, when this perfect God-man says to them that I'm leaving you, their emotions are emotions of fear and trouble. They, they don't get it. They don't understand why he has to leave. I mean, they thought that he's the king bringing in the kingdom. What's going on here? And so Jesus says something to them that we've got to recognize within the context. He says, if you love me, in verse 15. Circle that word if on your sermon handout. You see, it's conditional. He says, if you love me. And so, do they love Jesus? Do they not love Jesus? I mean, who here wants to vote for? They love Jesus. They followed him for for three years, they've laughed with him, they've cried with them, they've, they, they've eaten with him, they've, they've sweated with him, they, they've been on the seas in fear as he walked out on, I mean, they've encountered him. I mean, they must love him. That's what we want to believe. But when we turn to verse 28, we see the truth about their heart, soul, mind, and strength, about who they are. He says, you heard me say, I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad. In your soul, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. Circle that word, those words, if you loved me on your sermon handout. He's revealing their heart. He's revealing that they're still governed by sin in their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They're not rejoicing with the truth. They're not fellowshipping with the one who is holiness and the one who is love. In their selves, their hearts are broken and hurting. They're troubled. And it's so important that we understand that within this context because we're going to see that there's a gift that they need to receive. But let me point out that Jesus says the Father is greater than I. So important to see that. Jesus doesn't see himself as an equal to the Father. He sees himself as being subordinate to the Father. And that's so important because that's why the Father is governing Jesus' heart, soul, mind, and strength. You see, when one is greater, they are the governor of you. And you are to submit and surrender to their authority. And Jesus is submitting and surrendering to the Father's authority because the Father is greater. Now, 
The disciples are born in sin, and they're still treating the relationship with Jesus like a mutually equal relationship. They don't see yet that Jesus is greater. And, and they're, the only way they're going to get there is if they receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit. And so they need to be liberated and set free from their sin. So Jesus says to them over four times, and here's two illustrations. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. Now circle that word keep on your sermon handout. That word keep is in the future tense. It's because in the future when they receive the Holy Spirit, they're going to love Jesus and keep his commands. And then verse 23 says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. Circle that word keep. It's in the future tense. It, they don't love him yet. Not, not in the sense of divine love where they prefer what God prefers and where they see Jesus as greater and where they're governed by Jesus. Now, the commands in John that they're going to keep in the future are the commands to receive me, the command to follow me, the command to believe me, the command to abide in me, the command to ask me anything in my name and I will give it to you. And the command, ultimately, the, the primary command that the whole gospel is journeying towards, and we're going to look at next week in our last sermon in this series, receive the Holy Spirit. These are the commands they are to keep. But they need to work in them. You see, when Jesus was teaching, they haven't quite followed and bought into his teaching. I need to remind you back in John chapter 8, Jesus, this is what he taught. He says, then you will know the truth. I'm teaching you that you got to know the truth. You have to have a dynamic, authentic relationship with the truth. And the truth will set you free from the bondage of sin, from original sin, from the principle of sin. But you've got to know the truth. And in John 14, 6, Jesus shared with them right before this passage we read today, I am the way and the truth. You've got to know me. You see, they know him as Jesus. They, they've got to come to know him as Jesus Christ, Messiah, Son of the living God, the one who is worthy of worship the one that is worthy to govern their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so they have a real need in the text. And all of John's gospel is pointing us to this need, which is in chapter, revealed in chapter 20. And, and it's a promise that's to come in the future, in the disciples' lives, in the context of John chapter 14. And so, in John chapter 14, verse 16, it reads, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. This is their need. They need the Spirit. Circle that word he will give on your sermon handout. It's in the future tense. It's coming, but it hadn't come yet. But they desperately need it. They need the Holy Spirit. They need the Spirit of truth to set them free from the principle of sin. And so in verse 26, it reads, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Circle those words, will send, will teach, and will remind. They're all in the future tense. When they receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will teach them all things. The Holy Spirit will remind them of everything that Jesus said. You know, right there, we're told how John remembers what he writes in his gospel. When he received the Holy Spirit, when God sent the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was given by the resurrected Christ to his disciples in John chapter 20, the Holy Spirit taught John and reminded John of everything that Jesus said. And it's essential to Christian teaching to understand that to be set free from the power of sin, you have to receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit. Well, all of this in the context of worship. Jesus is pointing something to them. The reason why he's leaving them is 
the greatest act of worship to be observed in human history, and it's the cross. We need to understand that this is the act of holiness in human history, the act of truth in human history, the action of beauty in human history, and the act of love in human history. What happens on the cross? And so in John 14, 31, it reads, so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Jesus because he loves the Father. It is, he prefers the Father. He worships the Father. The Father is greater. He humbles himself and he takes on the form. He empties himself of self and takes on the form of a servant. And he dies on the cross of Calvary. You see, because he loves God, he does what God wills, what God desires, what God wants, what God requires of him. And, and so in the text, it's so important. I want you to understand that the chief end for Jesus is love. He loves the Father. He prefers the Father. The Father is first in his life. And the means for Jesus to love is to obey his Father, and in our context, it literally is to die on the cross of Calvary. It's the Father's will, because when Jesus Christ dies on the cross of Calvary, he defeats the power of sin and death through love. Now, we are often impatient in our reading and want to project faith and belief and power into the passage of Scripture. But John is making us be patient. He's making us wait for them to receive the Holy Spirit. But for those of us who are in the church today who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who have faith and place our trust in Jesus and have been gifted with the enablement of the Spirit to subordinate ourselves to His will, to His emotion, to His mind, and to His actions. We have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. But you see, when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, what happens is, is that we're set free from spiritual blindness, we learn in the Gospel of John. And we're set free from the principle of sin. And we're set free to know and have a dynamic relationship with the truth. And Jesus is the truth. We have a dynamic relationship with the God-man. And this does, as we saw last week in John chapter 9, this reverses the effects of the fall in us. We are given the gift of the Holy Spirit, and divine love is poured into us. And so, therefore, it's out of love. We love what God loves. We will what God wills. We feel what God feels. We think what God thinks. We submit and surrender to our God, and we do what our God does. That's what it is to be a follower, a believer, a Christian. And we do. We do love the Lord with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind and with all our strength. That's what it is to be a worshiper of God. And John says this, it's recorded, and, and Jesus is the one speaking it. It's on that day. What day? On that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. On what day will we know? On what day will we relate with Jesus and with the Father? What day is that when that dynamic fellowship, partnership, relationship occurs? What day is that? On the day you receive the Holy Spirit. That's the day. On that day, you were initially sanctified. On that day, you were regenerated. On that day, you enter into a divine fellowship 
a fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and with the apostles in the church, and with all believers in the universal church. On that day you will know that I'm in the Father, and you are in me, and I'm in you. That is an incredible day. Have you had that day? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and received forgiveness of your sins and be set free, been set free by the power of sin and you know you have an authentic, dynamic relationship with the one who is holiness, truth, beauty, and love? I'm telling you, when you've had that encounter, <laughs> when you've had a real, authentic experience of worship, you no. This is what worship is. Worship is being in that dynamic relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A holy relationship. A loving relationship. A truthful relationship, a beautiful relationship. It's being in the unity of the bond of peace. It's being in the relationship that your heart knows and your soul knows and your mind knows and your strength knows is the one that God designed you for. You're in the family. You're a child. So this morning, I want to encourage you because the end is to love God. The end is to honor God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Therefore, out of love, commit to number one, to be a lifelong worshiper of God. Number two, to set apart Sunday for corporate worship. It's essential. Number three, to train your children and grandchildren and one another to be long, lifelong worshipers of God, to honor God and to edify the church because you are the church. You belong to God, and you belong to one another. And number four, to join a local community of worshipers, to be in that dynamic relationship with the people of God who are in the dynamic relationship with God himself. And number five, to practice means of grace, the first of every day, because you can't get enough of hanging out with God. Think about prayer. I mean, ultimately, prayer is entering in, being invited into the Holy of Holies. Who doesn't want to hang out in the Holy of Holies of the living God where there's intercession by Jesus Christ and by the Spirit and where there is authentic fellowship, partnership, and sharing? Who doesn't want that? And then number six, which really is meant to inform all of these commitments, to give God the first of everything. When you look into Jesus' life, our flowing, filling, and flooding God, you will see that the overflow reveals that it's all about worship. Let's pray. Father, right now, you have invited us into your throne room. We are in your presence in the Holy of Holies. And Father, hallowed be thy name. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, um, may we May we worship you. May we 
God be transformed by this incredible gift of worship, this gift of authentic relationship with yourself that is meant for now and for eternity. Father, engage our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our strength in you. Remove the distractions of this fallen world. Help us through the empowerment of your spirit to teach us all things. Help us to see, help us to hear. Father, um, your word is beautiful. And Jesus, what a beautiful savior. Father, please, oh God, let us worship you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. At this time, please receive the Lord's Supper together. Gathering together looks different in these days, doesn't it? We're all gathered together in spirit in each and every home of the members of our church. In Matthew 18, Jesus said, For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. You might say, but I'm single. I'm in my home by myself. Well, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are with you. It's a gathering place. The real presence of Christ is with us in our homes we would not choose to worship in our homes. We would choose to gather together in a place of corporate worship. And we would take the elements together. But because of the time that we're in, we are in our homes. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three, it reads, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread... I'm going to take the bread right now. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together and be thankful. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together and be thankful for God's grace. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you, yes, you, all of you in your homes, you, you proclaim the Lord's death and all the benefits that we have in Christ through his blood, through his death, through his resurrection and his ascension. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We do remember today that we are a blessed people, that we have received all the promises and all the gifts, all the yeses in Jesus Christ. Thank you for touching us. Thank you for giving us this gift of being able to do this meal together. In your name we pray. Amen.